Welcome on back to the channel, y'all. It is Technical Tuesday. So today we're gonna to be talking about subject near and dear to my heart, and that is fishing worms and jigs, the full setup. Thank you guys for all the feedback on the Technical Tuesday videos. And go ahead, just comment, comment, comment down below. What do you wanna see next? Uh, or if you just like what I'm talking about, just give me a thumbs up. Hey, thanks, I like it, I like that stuff. I saw a lot of that on the last couple of videos. Uh, many of you appreciate like the, the deep dive into it. So we're gonna keep doing these. Throwing a jig and a worm is my favorite technique to do. Uh, the biggest bass of my life, the old Bertha sitting back behind me here, she came on a jig. I've caught uh, many of my biggest bass on worms and jigs. And it, I just love getting that thump. It's that excitement of the hard hit of especially a jig, but of throwing a bigger worm as well. You just get those boom, those, those one hard thumps that you know is a big bass. It's so exciting. But I definitely had a lot of trouble starting out with trying to figure out the gear to get those fish to the shoreline right when I started out or into the boat later on. The main takeaway from this is when you're fishing a jig and a worm, you need to beef up your gear. 99% of anglers that when they get that big thump, they're going to unleash wrath on that hook set. And it is hard to tone down. When you have years of experience and you know when you get that big bite, and the fish has probably got it and you don't need to rip the jaws off the bottom of the, the lake, uh, it can be very helpful to kind of, it's like a golf swing. You know you need to just tone that down a little bit to, to get that ball exactly where you need to be laying up on the green. But most of us, including myself, when I get a big bite, I'm going ahead and I'm just, I'm ripping lips, especially if I haven't got a lot of worm or jig bites that day or that week, or maybe I'm fishing a jig for the first time in March and I've been fishing a whole bunch of different other stuff up through the winter. So that's why you need to beef up the gear. I've learned this through a lot of break offs and this is the science behind why you're breaking off on your worms and jigs. So when a bass grabs a worm, they, you know, they give it a couple of chomps, and usually they just don't sit there. They start to move off a little bit. If you get lucky, the hook set is gonna go right in the roof of the mouth. The line is really not gonna touch their teeth at all. You're gonna go straight in the nose and you're basically getting the bass's jaw straight on a hook. Same thing with a jig. You know, your brush guard sweeps through, you get that hook set through the nose and you have zero contact on that line from the fish. You're fighting the pressure, the, the weight of the fish on the line, but you're not getting any abrasion on your line directly from the fish. That's if you get extremely lucky, but usually what happens? Okay, I got a fish, I'm gonna let him have it for a few seconds, or oh, he's running, and then you go and you jerk, and that fish a lot of times is moving in a different direction from when uh, he first bit the bait, so could bite it, and that line is on one side of his mouth. You go to set the hook, and that line is sweeping across its teeth, its whole jaw, and you're getting a full sandpaper effect on that line. And when you do it really hard and really quick, it just snaps that line. A lot of times, even if it's 17, uh, 20, it could snap it if you're up close and just putting a ton of pressure, snapping that hook set real hard. So that is important to keep in mind. If you can control that muscle memory and you're close to a fish, this is when it happens the most, is when it's like 10 feet out or under the boat, uh, when you have just low stretch and you snap it real hard. If you can learn to tone that down when you're close, then you've basically mastered uh, setting the hook on worms and jigs. But for the rest of us, they get really excited. That's why we're gonna bump up our line size to at least 17 pound. So I really never throw a, wor a big worm or a jig on less than 17 pound. Most of the time it's on 20 pound fluorocarbon. So the thing to keep in mind is it's not 
the poundage of the line. And this goes back to like when I was throwing the last technical Tuesday throwing top waters. It's not necessarily the, the poundage of the line when I want to throw 15 pound mono to get that, uh, that top water to float. It's the diameter. It's the, it's the buoyancy of the bigger diameter that that line size gives. It's the same thing on your worms and jigs. It's not that I need 20 pound line to fight a five pound bass. It's that I need that, that extra thick diameter to hold up to the abrasion that's going to happen when I set the hook on that bass's teeth. And if we're in Mondo land and there's a lot of timber or structure, I need to get that fish out of there quick. There's no halfway hook sets and let him run a little bit. I'm going 25 pound fluorocarbon. I am bringing the wrath and there is no holding up. And that's, that's basically I've never broken off a bass, maybe once or twice in Mexico on 25 where I'm absolutely just snapping the, the hook set up, flipping right in front of me. <clears throat> but I can't, I can only count on like one hand the times I've broken off 25 pound test fluorocarbon. That is a higher diameter line that the fish can see more, but usually if you're flipping that close, it's just coming down with a jig or craw worm and they're just boom, they're eating it on reaction. It's not like a crawling where they have more time to look at it. So line size was a big revelation to me when I was learning how to worm and jig fish because I threw 15 pound on everything. I would say usually you can throw 15 uh, and get away with it on, on just about everything, but not with the jig and worm because you need a good hook set. You, you're throwing a, a thicker worm, a bigger worm. The hook needs to penetrate through that plastic and be able to go all the way through and get into the fish's mouth. That's why you need a good hook set. The jig is even more so because you're dealing with a brush guard. And with that brush guard, you just require a big hook set. So what is really gonna help with that is increasing your rod length and also increasing your power. Most of the time when I'm jigging worm fishing, I'm throwing something over seven foot. My rod lengthens a little bit over the summertime. When things get really hot, I'll start making really long casts on points and you know dragging things a little bit and then I go to all the way out to like a seven six. But if I'm up close in the spring and post spawn, I'm pitching to timber, pitching to docks, um, where I need a little more control then I'm going like seven, two, seven, three, anywhere in that area. Um, but a seven foot is just a little short, I think overall, I mean, unless you're doing straight up dock skipping that seven foot is, um, it's just not as good with getting that hook set. The rod is heavy power and fast action. That is what I'm looking for on my worm and jig rods. If I wanted to throw braid, I would go down a power just to compensate for the zero stretch, but I really like throwing fluorocarbon uh, for the tooth reason that I talked about, that abrasive resistance. Braid is actually worse on bass's teeth. I know this, is, this may seem strange for a lot of people, but you will cut braid faster than you will fluorocarbon on, that, uh, on breaking it across their teeth. Fluorocarbon just holds up better to that. So I got my 20 pound fluoro. I got my at least seven foot two heavy power, fast action rod. Let's talk about the reel. When I started out worm and jig fishing, I think seven to one was like, that was the fastest that was out there. Most reels were in that six, two, six, five category. But over the years, reels have gotten faster and faster. And I would say, go as high as you can on your gear ratio. It's not like throwing a spinner bait or a bladed jig where you, you want a certain medium, you know, slow cadence or throwing crank baits or throwing big swim baits where you just need all that gear power. You're doing most of the work with the rod tip when you're fishing a worm and jig. You're, you're bringing it up and you're letting it fall. You know, you might be bouncing it, you might be dragging it, and then you're just reeling in the slack that you've pulled with the reel. But when it comes time to set that hook, you wanna take in that slack as much as possible. 
So many times this happens where a bass picks up your worm or jig and it starts coming at you. So immediately you're not really feeling the pressure. So if you have like a 6'2 or even a 7'1, seven, seven to one, you're not bringing in that line fast enough to really catch up and set that hook effectively on that fish. And even if you do get a good hook set at the beginning, that fish feels that pressure, it starts swimming out to deep water. If you're in a boat, it goes just straight under you and you can't catch up. You lose slack or you create slack in the line and then before you know it, the fish is off. Another thing that I've come to like about the faster gear ratio reels is just being able to reel it in real quick and make a long pitch. So what I'm opposed to like flipping, if I'm making longer pitches at dock posts or you know timber or something like that, I can get in real quick and I can just go to the next one. Get it in real quick, go to the next one. It just saves you a couple of seconds on each retrieve, just makes you a little more efficient angler. So when I'm talking about jigs and bigger worms, I'm relating to at least three eighths ounce and up on jigs. And then, you know, at least a quarter ounce weight on my Texas rig. This isn't lighter type finesse stuff throwing you know, little bugs and little things like that. This is, um, I'm expecting to get a bigger bite on these baits. This is my typical late season worm setup where I've got anywhere from a quarter up to a half ounce Texas rig weight on here. Got that bobber stop in front and I'm making sure that when I rig my hook in here that everything is going on straight. Now when I'm throwing a bigger worm like this Mondo worm, I like to throw a five odd hook. That's what I use most of the time. Some, sometimes I'll go up to a six, but I find that the five just gives a little more action on the, the body, the tail, and I still get good hookups with it. Rigging up the jig, same concept applies with the worm. You wanna make sure your plastic is going on there straight. The way you do that is you thread a little more plastic on there than you think you would need, and then push it all the way up onto the plastic keeper. But a big tip with your jig is the plastic and the skirt is gonna control your fall. You can add more plastic to slow it down. You can add less plastic to make it a quicker, uh, more snappy action. And usually I like to do that in more finesse scenarios or when it's just hotter and fish like a little faster action. But make sure your skirt material is not interfering with your plastic appendages on your trailer. You don't want that to make your trailer not move. So usually I'll take some scissors, trim it up a little bit. And also when you trim your skirt up, you can add action to it. So when you stop your jig or when it's resting on the bottom, that skirt will flare out more the shorter that you cut it. So we talked about the gear. Now let me give you another tip on how to break off less when you get these big bites. So a lot of people, when they get their reels, and they're fishing a worm in the jig, they just want to crank that drag down and give it to them. But actually I have found if you back that drag off to where you can just pull it with a hard tug on the line, right about there, where it's gonna give a little bit on that hook set. So you got that first initial pop surge now, hopefully you don't get a pop and live pops, but you pull back, you got that heavy weight surge, that first little drag pull, and then you get the fish going and you can let that drag work for you a little bit if need be. But usually the, where you need that drag to be perfect is, is on that hook set. And I've found that with spinning as well, uh, obviously a lot different than spinning. Um, but when I got this heavier line on here, I just want it to pull a little bit to absorb. If I over, if I power down on that fish, I want that drag to slip just a hair. That's something that you guys are gonna have to experiment with to get it perfect for you. But I have found if I can just pull out a little bit, uh, then it's, it's perfect. When I get the hook set, I'm still able to get the fish and uh, I don't break them off. Final tip that we'll end with is the actual hook set. So how to get better, better hookups. Uh, it's, it's very easy a lot of times as soon as you feel that bite to go straight up with that rod tip. But that fish may have moved after it already bit. Sometimes they're swimming away from you 
and when you go ahead and, and swing, it's fine. The fish is going away, it's adding pressure, but usually what happens is they'll swim off to either side and you don't really know, they may be coming at you. So it is best to keep your rod at like 10 o'clock, you know, work the bait from 10 to, to noon. And then when you get a bite, reel down. And I usually like to reel down three or four times until I get that line tight where I'm pointing more right at the fish and I'll just come up not in a real snappy way, but with just a, just a lean, just a hard lean on them and get that rod tip up and get pressure on them. Again, what you're trying to avoid is that hard snap where you're snapping the slack out of the line and that fish has got a bait on one side of its mouth and you're just ripping it real quick to the other side. That's usually where you get break off. So if you can reel that tip towards the fish, and maybe just move that line a little bit, not enough to really move the bait out of their mouth and just take out the slack and get a hard lean instead of a snap, you're gonna break off a lot less. This is hard to do. It is something you gotta practice. Just get a lot of bites with and figure it out. You'll find that once you get like 10, 10 of those bites and you get that system down, then you're just nailing them every time. But it's when you don't get a bite for four hours, you get that one hard thump and you're like, oh man, I gotta got get them. And then you end up setting the hook really hard and you break the fish off or lose the fish or something. That's usually how it works. So the more experience you get with it, the better dialed you will be. All right, fishing freaks, thank you for tuning in to another Technical Tuesday video. Subscribe so you don't miss more and all the other adventure vlogs on this channel. Don't forget to comment down below what you want to see on the next Technical Tuesday, and I appreciate all you guys' great feedback on it. So, I will see you on the next one. You get on something crazy, holler. I'll do the same. <laughs>